person leaving other people in charge and expecting the other people to do what they had been asked to do while they were absent. Because the point Jesus wants, Jesus wants to make is this is about the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is coming, but it's not our job to work out when that's going to be. Our job is to keep doing what we're doing. Our job is to continue to be the people of faith that we are while we wait for the kingdom to happen. And there's a consequence if we don't. And the consequence here is very dramatic. It's about judgment. Um, but you've got to be careful. Don't hear judgment as condemnation. Hear judgment far more in terms of putting things right. In the broadest sense, the world is broken. There are things about the world that just aren't working as they, we believe they ought to. And that when God comes to bring the kingdom of heaven fully into reality, God will make right that which is broken. It's about restoring things to their right place. So think about judgment more as about putting things in the right place. And you're all familiar with this idea of putting things in the right place. Um, some of us uh, have very strong views about dishwashers. Uh, there is a right way and a wrong way to load a dishwasher. Uh, and um, often the people with whom we share our life do not share that clear vision. <laughs> and they have to be corrected. And we, we exercise in the nicest possible way righteous judgment when we put things in the, <laughs> you put them in the right place. There's a, there's a similar problem with hanging out washing. Uh, that, uh, it, it's one of the ways you find out whether uh, your, the way you've grown up is different to the way your, your partner or your friend's grown up is just talk about how to hang out washing and you'll discover very quickly that their family's completely wrong <laughs> and yours has always been right it, it's trivial I know and, and I, I'm trivialising it because I want to make the point that putting things right is not condemnation it's about the consequence of the brokenness of the world. As God makes the world whole, there is a consequence to that. And what the shocking thing that Jesus suggests is that while we wait for the kingdom, our, our responsibility as people of God is to continue to be people of God. Don't stop. Don't, build, don't bury your faith in the ground while you wait. Don't hide but be courageous, take a risk and be a person of faith, even in a time of waiting. And the harsh thing about the parable is there is a consequence. If you bury the treasure in the ground, the risk is that you are excluded from the kingdom. It talks about that exclusion, that you're no longer part of the kingdom. Uh, and, and that's the... That's the, the heart of it. And it's, it's very hard and confronting. But that's what Jesus wanted to do. He wanted to say that while we wait for the kingdom, even if you're talking about a broken, corrupt uh, kingdom of the world, there are rules about how you wait. And if you don't do that, there is a consequence to it, which is to it be excluded. In the parable, it's exclusion from the master's support. In Jesus' parable, there's a consequence. If we do not continue to live as people of faith, then how will God find us when God does what God will finally do? So it leaves us with a question of what do we do while we wait? How do we live in this time of waiting? And there's not, this isn't a particular time of waiting. We spend our whole lives waiting uh, one way or another. Um, I was thinking about travelling uh, and my, so back in the days when you could have international travel international travel was a matter of waiting from the time you waited for your partner or spouse to be ready or your kids to be ready to believe on the journey to the time you get to the hotel you've just had event, a waiting event after waiting event after waiting event just goes on and on so how will we live? I think we have to live as people of faith in a very simple way. 
We have to live with the belief that Christ will come. And it's not our, our business or our need to know when that's going to be, but simply to know that as we wait, we should live as people of faith. So let me give you an example. We are now, whether you like it or not, in the run-up to Christmas. You might argue that it's wrong because it's not Advent yet or any of those very reasonable arguments. Uh, talk to the supermarkets. <laughs> they know we're on the run-up to Christmas. Now, for some of us, that's going to confront us with some interesting conversations with our family and friends. It's going to confront us with some interesting things about um, people who we share our lives with who do not share our faith. And the, the question is going to be, do we bury our faith in the ground in order to be friendly to those who, with whom we will share life over the next six, eight weeks? Or do we take a risk and proclaim our faith even in the uh, light of perhaps some condemnation? And I'll just tell you again a story I'm sure I've told you before. It's a story of, uh, of someone she was an older woman who was going to see family for Christmas and she travelled, I think, north. Probably, let's say it was Queensland, but it could have been anywhere. But she arrived and on Christmas Eve she said, I'd, I'd really like to go to church. It's Christmas Eve, I'd like to go to church. And her son said, oh, Mum, it's too late, it's dark, it's dangerous. You shouldn't go to church on Christmas Eve. I'm not going to take you, it's too risky for you. He said, oh, OK. Well, I'd like to go to church on Christmas Day. There's an eight o'clock service, and that would be really nice. And he said, Mum, with the children, I mean, eight o'clock, that's when they're going to get up and they're going to want their presents. If you go to church, you're going to spoil Christmas. <laughs> and that's the risk. So she, for her, that this woman, it's about being courageous enough to say, actually, it matters to me. My faith matters to me. And I love you dearly, but I will go to church. And I'll work out how to do it. If you're not going to take me, that's fine. But you need to understand that I'm a person of faith. I pray and I believe in God and I need to be there at Christmas. We will have, perhaps not that conversation, but we will share time with dearly loved friends, family, neighbours, uh, who don't share our faith. And the question is, what do you do about that? What do you do about that? And I think that what we're called to is to dare to be people of faith, even in the smallest ways. And that could be something as simple as, I will pray for you. But to say something out loud, and to take an action, to go to church, to do whatever will be good for you to do, um, to insist on watching a programme on television which is hymns and readings or whatever it might be, just to say, this is part of what I believe and this is how I want to live. Now, if you're fortunate enough not to be in that situation, be aware that for many people of faith, Christmas becomes a time of fraught negotiation. So pray for those for whom they must negotiate with children and children's spouses and whoever it might be, to hold on to a heart of faith in the midst of it. And don't let it be buried. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen.